Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Reiber. I'm Chief Justice. I really appreciate all of you who have uh, made the effort to be here. You are our, I think, seventh county. Is that right, Terry? That sounds right. I think that's right. Seventh county. We've been all over the state. We started in Addison County last um, August, I think it was. We've been down to Bennington. We've been up to Essex County, where we had a group not much smaller than this, I have to tell you. Um, it, was a, it was a good uh, session. Um, I one of the things I love about this project that we've been doing, uh, Gary Franklin and Terry Corsones and I, is these historic buildings around the state where we've had these meetings. Um, I see the, uh, the uh, pledge that uh, is uh, memorialized on the wall over there back from back in 1912 when I guess this structure was built. Uh, everybody chipped in 23 bucks as I read it and uh, the property was purchased. And Pete Seeger's over here on this side. So I love the, the fact that we're in these historic places. Uh, with me is Judge Mary Teachout. Judge Teachout is the presiding judge in Washington County. Uh, this is the form that we followed in all the counties around the state. Every county has a presiding judge. Uh, next to Mary is Gary Franklin. Gary is the president of the Vermont Bar Association. And Heidi Groff is at the other end. And Heidi is president of the Washington County Bar Association. This project started, well, let me, uh, let me uh, just back up uh, one step. Um, I've been meeting with the leadership of the VBA for a number of years. Every month we have a meeting. And when the new president of the association comes in, uh, we have sort of a, a kickoff meeting and decide, talk about what we're both interested in. It turned out when Gary Franklin came into office uh, last summer, I think it was, um, we both had the same interest, which was to try to do a community outreach project, a project where we would invite uh, people from the uh, local uh, community to come in and talk to us about the courts, talk to us about the profession. Uh, no agenda. We have no agenda here uh, other than to answer questions and provide information and hear your comments about uh, those subjects. We can't talk about cases, of course, uh, so specific questions about particular cases uh, are really, that's something that we're we're not at liberty to discuss, but we're certainly interested to hear what you have to say. So again, I want to thank you for coming uh, out this afternoon. And I'll let uh, my friend Gary Franklin make a few comments, and then we'll see where we go from there. Great. Thank you, Chief. Uh, as, uh, as you just heard, I'm the president of the Vermont Bar Association. My name is Gary Franklin. And uh, the way the Bar Association works, is it has a board of managers which sort of oversees the outreach for, for the association. And, um, and then we have a rotating presidency where you get a one, a one year term as the president and then you get to serve as past president and kind of a three year cycle, president elect, president, past president. So this is my year. And um, I was delighted to, to hear uh, the chief wanting to do this community outreach because I thought it was very important. And you see a lot of things in the news about people really needing to understand civics uh, so that we could have a uh, hopefully a more thoughtful and, and more productive discourse than, than sometimes it seems to, to that, that we're having. Um, the Vermont Bar Association is very committed to access to justice. So that means providing services to the public and providing services to its members to try to get people to connect. You'll see on the table back there, um, uh, we've put together a list. Uh, uh, Terry Corzone is our executive director who's, who's uh, highly involved in all of this. It's put together a list of pro bono and low bono services. So these are services that are established through, through the Vermont Bar Association or promoted by the Vermont Bar Association to help people that can't otherwise afford lawyers. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's important that, that you know what those services are. Uh, so encourage you to take, um, take that. We also have these green cards for the Vermont Lawyer Referral Service. So when people go to court, 
they're not sure what to do. Um, they'd like to call a lawyer. Uh, they don't know where to start. This is one place to start. And we have green cards with phone numbers for the Vermont Bar Association's lawyer referral service. Um, one of the things that um, we'd also like to really understand is what people think about legal services and what people think about the court system. Uh, is it working? Is it not working? Uh, we'd like to hear what people think so that we can try to respond <coughs> to that. Uh, there's clearly a disconnect out there in the world between people who need lawyers and lawyers who need clients. There are a lot of people going to court now without representation. And um, you find that county by county, state by state, nationwide, there are a lot of people. Some of it's just a self-help culture. That's part of it. But part of it is people just not knowing where to turn or whether they can afford it. Um, and, um, and there's clearly, as I said, a bit of a disconnect. And so we'd like to hear a little bit more why. Uh, if you can share your experiences or if you have questions, uh, we'd love to hear them. The Vermont Bar Association is really happy to be able to provide this kind of forum for these kinds of discussions. So thanks so much for coming, and we'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks, Gary. I want to give uh, Judge Teach out or Heidi a chance to say a few words if you're interested, or we can open it up for questions. Judge? Well, it's uh, my privilege to be the presiding judge here in Washington County for a third year, but I'm, uh, here we are in a historic building, so I'll give you a little historic perspective. Uh, I. Uh, first, I'm not from Washington County, but my husband was born in Washington County and grew up here. And I have several children and grandchildren who now live here. But I first sat in the family court in Barrie uh, about 25 years ago. And in, at that time, uh, I spent four days a week doing family cases, uh, divorce and uh, parentage and juvenile, and one day a week at the um, uh, Vermont State Hospital in Waterbury doing mental health cases. Now it's very different. The, the, um, the one day a week at uh, doing mental health cases is no longer done out of the family court in Barrie. It's done out of the um, civil court in Montpelier. And the family court judge is really overwhelmed with uh, cases of all types. The opioid crisis has had a big effect, and uh, there have been changes in the law that have brought many, many more cases. So the, there's been a real shift in that docket. And I first sat in the civil division, where I am now in Montpelier, about 20 years ago. And at that time, the, uh, uh, we had a lot of trials. Um, there were, there were it was just routine to have trials, and there were very few evictions or foreclosures. Um, but a lot of things have changed since then as a result of the financial crisis and the aftermath and the way uh, the society is structured now. Um, we have, and mediation came in for, uh, so that when cases, if they're going to go to a jury trial or, or a lengthy court trial, they generally go to mediation first. And mediation has had a huge impact. We don't have so many trials anymore. Uh, lots and lots of cases settle uh, in mediation. I think it's more cost effective for people and also um, it, people can forge an agreement or a resolution uh, themselves. But on the other hand, we have lots of evictions and foreclosures and collection of debt cases. And for those cases, almost automatically, people can't afford a lawyer. And as you were saying, uh, there, we, there are just lots of cases now where people cannot afford a lawyer and uh, could do with legal services. We do hand out the green cards, and the Vermont Bar Association has developed a lot of programs that they didn't have 20 years ago uh, to help people try to get access uh, to lawyers. Legal Aid does a, um, a workshop uh, when we do evictions so that um, people can get some legal help on those days, too. So those have been positive developments. But those are just some of the changes that we've seen over time in this uh, specific uh, county. And 
Um, I think that it'll be interesting to see how things evolve, but I don't see it happening anytime soon that a lot more people will have um, legal help unless we continue to work on um, programs to make that available. Thanks, Judge. Uh, Heidi? I am most interested in hearing um, any questions that you all have. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm the local attorney. Um, I've been practicing in, um, in Montpelier now for 20 years. Um, and we um, have a small organization of about 40 attorneys that regularly come and the local judges. And we do talk about topical things. And we, um, we love to hear from the judges about you know, local practice and things that are going on. But we'd love, I think, in this forum to answer any questions that you might have. I think this is very mysterious for a lot of people, um, the court system and, and you know, what do lawyers do and, and what, kind of, um, what kind of problems can be resolved in the court system. And so I, I'd much rather hear from you than, than to spend my time telling you about myself. OK, thank you. All right, so we'll open it up for questions and um, or comments about the uh, about the justice system, uh, courts, uh, the legal profession. Anyone have anything uh, they'd like to bring up? Well, this will be a quick meeting, I guess. <laughs> we have a, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, in the blue tie back there. So, folks in the audience. Four different perspectives here, and I, I'm just curious briefly what each one of you thinks is the biggest challenge before the judiciary at this point in time. Uh, I'll start by saying I think that it's something that Judge Teachout alluded to, which is um, the number of uh, cases we're seeing that are opiate related, uh, addiction related. Um, it started out as uh, uh, and Im impacting on the criminal docket, and now it's in the very much in the family docket, uh, child protection cases specifically. We've uh, run out of um, guardians ad litem in uh, some counties. Uh, the number of lawyers that are doing this work is challenging at best, so that uh, scheduling uh, cases and the Continuation of cases is uh, very, very difficult. It can be very, very difficult. We're not actually uh, able to keep up with the incoming case flow in some counties. In one county in particular, a couple years ago, we added a courtroom to try to keep up with the numbers um, and immediately uh, got pushback from the sheriff, from the state's attorney, from the Public Defender's Office from the uh, Department of Children and Families, all of them saying, you know, if you're going to start handling more cases through this courthouse, uh, we're not equipped to meet uh, more numbers going through. So that is the top thing on my list these days, and um, I'll let Judge Teach out pick it up from there if she has anything. Well, I've already mentioned um, the, the need that people have for legal advice. And uh, people don't always need to have a lawyer representing them all the way through um, a case from in court from beginning to end. Sometimes they just need advice. Uh, they need to understand what their options are and uh, some help in making a choice. And, and the court system is not really set up to do that. Uh, when I became a, a lawyer, uh, I started working for a lawyer whose sign was attorney and counselor at law. And the counseling role, giving advice, um, ed educating people about uh, what the law is that pertains to their situation and helping them figure out what to do, is a, is a big role that um, attorneys can really help play. And people come to the court sometimes hoping that the court will do that for them, and, and we can't. So we, we um, as I said before, I think a big challenge is helping people get the information they need to help them make some sometimes very difficult decisions in their life. 
it's a great question, and uh, you know, one of the ways is that uh, we try to address the problem that Judge uh, Teachout just just raised again is like these lawyer referral services and 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 um, the ability to where, what do you do? Where do you, what's your first stop? Um, hopefully, we can get the word out effectively that it can be the Vermont Bar Association to at least connect you to somebody, even if it's for our, uh, just a consultation, which is sometimes all you need is an hour just to try to understand. Where you even begin? What do you do? But really, to directly answer um, your question, uh, Judge Gerson, I guess I would have uh, I'd answer it in two ways, sort of from a tactical and a strategic standpoint. Standpoints, um, sort of the more immediate, the, the immediacy seems to be one of resources, and uh, uh, the chief has touched on it in terms of the challenges that are brought to the courts, which is where courts are almost sort of addressing social services type issues, and, um, and, and there need to be more resources. And I should point out that there's, there, for those of you that don't know, and some of you obviously do, that there's, there's really two different court systems. We've got the federal system and the state system, and we're dealing today here really with the state system, like what's going on with the state of Vermont. But there's a federal system, and there's a federal federal uh, 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 jurisdiction here in Vermont, and and I practice in both courts, federal and, and state. And when you when you're in the federal court, you you can feel the difference. You can recognize the difference in terms of the what what resources, how resources matter, in terms of the ability for the judges to have clerks and and uh, people who are. Um, you know, assisting the process, not just for the number of judges, but the number of support staff and people that, that work on cases. It helps cases go through. Um, it helps um, get uh, sometimes a better, a better thoughtful process for each case. And, um, and when you look at our budget in Vermont, it's a fraction for the judiciary of, as to what it is for the other branches of government. And, and so resources, I, I think, you know, the court system is getting what it's asking for, more or less. But but um, it seems that 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 can be um, made more robust. The system could be more robust. The other thing, just from a more long-term thinking, which is really critical, is just civics, civics education, and what people. You know, the fear I have is that at some point somebody is going to go. Uh, they're they're going to go to go to court with a traffic ticket or something and they're going to argue the ticket and the judge is going to say, sorry, you've got to pay your ticket. And they're just going to walk out and say, eh, I don't, I, whatever. I'm not listening to what he or she said. It doesn't, I'm, and, and they just start to ignore what happens. Uh, court orders and, uh, you know, what, because it's, it's a con social contract we live under, right? You know, you know what, you go to court and things happen and rulings are made and you abide by the law. Um, and when people don't even know that a court system exists or they don't understand what the different branches of government do or um, it's a, I think it's a, it's a real issue. They don't really know what their rights are um, and that just somebody, it's just another just voice of telling them what to do that they may decide to agree with or may decide not to agree with and, and, and um, that's a real threat um, to, uh, to our system and so and the way to really combat that is through, is through civics. Um, the civic education. So I just want to follow up on something that Judge Chichel said also because I think that it's very difficult for people to find attorneys a lot of the time. Um, there is the lawyer referral service through the VBA and um, there is also Vermont Legal Aid um, is a resource that people can use. Um, I think it's a lot about connecting people with resources and information. The um, judiciary website is very robust. I can tell you that it's improved a lot in the time that I've been practicing where people who are not attorneys can do, um, can get some information online about what's gonna happen in court. There's a wonderful, wonderful page about small claims court in Vermont um, that's very helpful, that has all the forms on it, that tells people what their expectations should be. The family court in Vermont has been, um, over the years, many, many years, um, been made much more user friendly in terms of the clerks will show you what forms you need if you have a custody issue going on or a divorce going on or child support or something like that. But as we've been talking about, the court system itself is not really set up to advocate for people and to be that resource. 
Um, but I think that there are programs that are available uh, and the VBA is a great place to start. I know that when I was a baby lawyer, I came over and volunteered in the family court. There was a half day, I think, and two, we split it up to give people information about um, representing themselves in their um, divorces. And we even served as mediators through the program. And there's some of that that goes on still. There's some that goes on for small claims court. There, there are programs that people can get involved in and there are resources um, that people can tap into, but it's about doing research online and trying to figure out what's available locally. I think these low bono projects are great. There's some limited representation that some attorneys will do in certain cases. And I think it's important to realize that not every attorney works on an hourly basis. So sometimes I hear when people come to meet with me, is this gonna be really expensive? Before they even come in the door, they wanna make sure that they're not going to be making a bad choice and you know owe a bunch of money. And a lot of attorneys work on a contingency fee or a fee that's an hourly contingency depending on the outcome. So I think it's about information. It's about letting people know that there's other resources out there to get into court. I think a few years ago I would have said one of the biggest challenges is just getting all the cases heard in the amount of time, but the dockets have really shrunk since mediation, since alternative dispute resolution. Many, many more cases are being resolved outside of the court system, and so I think that is much better for people um, than it has been in the past. Okay, does that bring up any uh, burning questions here? Anyone have a comment about what you've heard? Yes? I don't want to use the floor if anyone else has questions. That's all right, Lisa, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking if we could imagine a docket without an opioid crisis in Vermont, and what I wonder is, it's easy to view that as a, as a criminal problem and a court problem, which is how we do, but could it be perhaps more productively viewed as a mental health, public health mm -hmm. kind of issue? And when we talk about strains on resources, as Gary was mentioning, I, I totally appreciate the, the rule of law concern that underlie your comments. But I wonder, is there like a bigger way of looking at helping the judiciary by just shifting a lot of the opioid issue thinking to a public health issue, for example, and I'll finish here in a minute. Um, it used to be that the best predictor of whether a child would finish high school was how that child was performing in the sixth grade. Now we're down to the second grade. That's the best predictor of whether a child will finish high school, and it's because of truancy, because they're not second graders are missing school because they're at home taking care of younger siblings or mom or dad who's not taking care of themselves. And so I just wonder if there's some kind of big picture thinking where we can actually help the judiciary by treating people not as criminals but as people who need help and kind of approach the allocation of resources from that perspective. As you know, I've been thinking about this for a lot of years. Well, I, you know, I would, one of the things I would say is that I think Vermont is ahead of most states in the country. And this is not, the opiate problem is not um, specific or unique to Vermont. This is a problem uh, that uh, states and courts uh, and social services are, are facing all across the country. So we're not alone in this by any means. But one of the things that we've done uh, when Governor Shumlin was in office was to start this hub and spoke model uh, of treatment, which is really in the vanguard uh, of, of states across the country that are trying to address what is not only a very difficult problem in terms of, of recidivism, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but also because of, of the nature of addiction. Uh, and addiction-related behavior. Uh, but one of, the, one of the challenges I think we face in this state that is um, uh, not easy to address is the rural nature of our communities, by and large. And so when you think about that, what, what you're really talking about is 
are places that are fairly isolated in terms of services, availability of services for treatment, uh, places that are isolated uh, in terms of uh, the availability of public transportation. And so the, the, uh, the notion of having, and th th again, this is a challenge exactly the same that many other states uh, I hear about are facing as well, but this model uh, I think is is innovative in trying to bring services even to remote areas. The problem of recidivism and, and um, addiction related behavior, whether you're talking about in the criminal sense or in a family law sense, uh, is something that really is uh, a struggle to address. And I, I think, you know, there are many, but again, I think we're doing uh, really a very good job with pretrial diversion. Uh, the uh, Attorney General, uh, Josh Diamond is here, the Attorney General's office has um, the, uh, uh, what is it, Josh, up in Memorial County that is the community, ju our community justice program. Community justice program, and I, I actually was up there with Judge Pearson and Terry Scott, who's here as well, uh, to um, observe about two weeks ago and it's phenomenal what they're doing. You know, it, it, so the, the, they've got a docket call with, uh, on a given day, with um, a, a whole broad range of crimes uh, that are being arraigned, different people are being arraigned on those crimes. And they actually have the services uh, in the courtroom. As soon as the arraignment happens, uh, the uh, people who provide the service, who do triage to uh, try to get these folks involved in treatment, follow them right out of the courtroom and interview them outside in the hallway and try to uh, you know, get them engaged in services. Now, this isn't a system that applies to all kinds of crimes, of course, but um, <clears throat> the notion that we need to try to address uh, you know, recidivating uh, offenders who are committing low level of crimes that are really related more to their addiction than to anything else. These are people that we've got to figure out how to deal with outside the criminal justice system. And I, this is what uh, that project is doing and it's, it's really quite impressive. But I'll stop because Judge D. Judd's got more experience about this than I do. Well, the person who has more experience is Judge Morrissey who's sitting in the front row. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you might have some observations. Like, um, through your long experience in the criminal courts and seeing this opioid crisis now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, whether the criminal. Yeah, so, so I currently preside here in uh, Barry, in the criminal docket. I oversee the uh, treatment court right now. Um, I was a prosecutor in Burlington for about 20, 21 years, and we were we started a, the RIC program, this rapid intervention program in Burlington, which I think is sort of what. Um, Tamarack and the other some of these other pretrial programs are modeled on and it really is was designed to intervene at a very early stage in the process. People tend to be most invested in the um, if they committed a, a, an offense that day. You know, if you can talk to people that day when offenses have, an offense has happened and try to get them engaged in services early on, you can usually I think you have a better outcome in terms of getting them engaged as opposed to waiting until they come to court two or three weeks later um, to respond to something. So that was, a, that was sort of our, the premise of that program. And now, I think we saw Ashley Hill and yes, uh, Mr. Rings, uh, Pastor are here. They're, they're here as well. Um, the state attorney's office here in Washington. And they, a lot of cases do get diverted out of the system now for these low level, more low, actually some of is low level, you think, but uh, for people, uh, offenses that really are seemingly motivated by um, by drug use and use a need for substances, those are diverted out of the system. So we're not seeing those same, um, the resources of the criminal justice system really being used for that purpose because they're getting diverted out. Now the treatment court is very different because you've got people who have um, committed much more serious offenses and the team is comprised of, I'm on it, we have a public, a public defender on it, uh, Mr. Majakis from the state's attorney's office is on it, we have mental health professionals, we have substitute professionals, DOCs on it, we've got law enforcement liaisons on it. So it really is this team approach in trying to provide support, uh, accountability um, for people, many people who yet to be held accountable to a significant degree for offenses in a very real-time way. <laughs> 
So that if a person, we see them every two weeks, uh, sometimes more frequently when they're struggling. Um, but the whole idea is to keep very close tabs on these folks and to, as I said, sort of in real time respond to their, um, to whatever their crisis is that may bring them back to using substance abuse. I think a, a one thing that really sometimes can be overlooked is that many of the people who are um, addicted have uh, significant trauma histories. You know, they're the people who uh, may be the neglected, um, the people, the kids who were neglected 10, 15 years ago and now sort of graduated to the criminal justice system and they have trauma histories. And until you really address, I think, what the trauma has been in their life that leads them to want that escape in drugs, that leads them to say that, you know, reality is not something I want to be a part of. I'm happier when I'm using drugs. Until you resolve those underlying issues, I think it's very hard to have success. So that's why it's really important that we have a mental health component as part of the treatment court to provide that support and um, have people engage, not just in having clean ways, but also to address those underlying issues. The goal here is not to have short-term success, but rather long-term success. And from my perspective, until you address those underlying issues that originally brought them to drug use, you really, I'm not sure that you can have long-term success. So um, I agree that the opiate crisis has permeated every docket, whether it's a juvenile docket, the criminal docket, the family docket. Uh, many people who come into family court and they're having issues with their family, that's substance, substance use related. And then the family docket, you don't have that same level of resources. If it's, the family, if it's the juvenile docket, you have DCF. If it's the criminal docket, you've got DOC. The family docket, you don't really have that level of resources. So I do think that um, you know, this is something that needs to be addressed on a widespread, um, um, in a widespread way. But I do think that progress is being made. I think that the state's attorney's office here in Washington County, that they, as I said, they divert a lot of cases out that have uh, substance abuse issues to programs in the community. So I think that um, the, you know, the criminal justice system should, should not perhaps be the uh, the center point for that occurs, but I think in re reality, that's where it occurs. I just might add to the, I would say the legislature is very tuned into this problem and they're trying to address it and we're working with them, um, uh, you know, extensively to try to partner uh, um, with other uh, arms of government in bringing uh, solutions to the problem, but it's not an easy problem to fix. And what I've said to them a number of times is, uh, you know, if, if, if there was one thing you could do to try to address this problem, it would have been done uh, already. It, the, the fact is that it needs uh, uh, solutions from a number of different points of view, um, different entities, prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, social workers, as well as the courts, and it's just, so it's just not an easy problem. And as as the judge is talking, she she's making the point that I think is very important, which is that um, intervention and effective intervention is really uh, what's key, and, and early intervention, and that's a very difficult uh, thing to do, um, and and I think that's one of the struggles that we're having right now. Um. I know for the last two years, we've had to organize the legislator days at the courthouse, and they've come and asked all the questions about the drug courts. They've attended drug court to try to figure out how to get a handle on, you know, maybe having, I don't know how many drug courts there are currently in the state of Vermont, but certainly not every county has a drug court. I mean, I think this is pretty, um, Burlington, Northern Washington has one, Rutland has one, and then uh, Windsor has a DWI court. And then Franklin County has a Google treatment court, much smaller. Right. But I think they are headed in that direction. I, I, they want to know numbers. They want to know how much success it's seen. And I think those things are sometimes difficult to measure, but. I think they are. Uh -huh. Thank you. So is there any program like that for? Non-drug-related first-time offenders. Non-drug-related. So yes, diversion. So you you mean something like a 
somebody who just goes and steals something yeah. because they're impulsive. Yeah, when they first start, yes, in yeah. order to, to, to kind of yes. them in the right direction. Yes, diversion. Yeah, well, there is that yes. in all counties? Or? I think, yeah, okay. I, I have to think that yeah. every county has yeah. diversion yeah. programs. Yes. I, I used to be a deputy state's attorney, and um, we commonly would get cases sent up to us. Um, usually they're misdemeanors to qualify, but occasionally they'll be a felony if it's nonviolent. Um, that could be considered for diversion, and the qualifications are usually that somebody has not been previously convicted, and um, the state's attorney will review the information and the record with the, um, the investigating agency, the police, and um, certain cases were offered diversion. And what that means is sometimes they have a more restorative justice kind of bent. They, they may, in order to successfully complete diversion, they may be asked to write a letter of apology or attend a class to learn more about the particular offense or the particular issue at hand. But I think that opportunity is, is commonly offered in what we call low-level offenses, um, misdemeanors, and a lot of times people take it and then they actually don't have a record of their, um, of that experience. So that's nice, it keeps, it gives them another chance. So is there an age limit for that or is that? There's anyone? not. Okay. Yeah. And I just mentioned that somebody talked about truancy um, and the importance of kids getting to school. That's where the community justice and the community restorative justice centers come in. Um, the one that the chief was um, referring to in Lamoille County, um, there they gave us an incredible number. So Lamoille County is a fairly small county, but I think it covers three school districts. And there was several hundred kids who were truant, and you know they send the letters home after 10 days and after 20 days. And with that case management out of Lamoille County, I think she said only in the end, was it three cases ended up actually having to get to the court system. So they were able to work uh, with those families and get things back on track for getting the kids to school. So, so I don't, I'm, you know, I think that's something that communities um, should look into as far as having those kind of restorative centers. They're important. Yes. Uh, one of my questions is, uh, many other states have a domestic violence court similar to the setup as the drug treatment court, and I'm wondering if the Vermont Judiciary area has ever considered that, or what that would look like, if that's, there's an opinion on that being something that would happen in the future. What do you envision a domestic violence court looks like? Yeah. Can well, you many be getting states, more specific? Many other states have it, and it's a very similar model to the drug treatment court where uh, offenders who are charged with domestic assault come back regularly to make sure that they are following their conditions of release and that they're getting those services that they need so that they're not just sent back into their community with conditions of release signing up for failure, that they will probably eventually violate the conditions or the RFA. We do in Washington County have the domestic violence docket, the RFA docket, um, but Many other states also have specific domestic violence courts for the criminal side. Let me ask my friend Judge Pearson to respond to this. So the short answer is we used to have a domestic violence docket. Actually, there was one down in Bennington that operated for about two or three years. Um, the, we have a rotation system, so judges will only stay in a court for a limited period of time and then rotate out. Uh, they were quite successful in that court, but it took um, a real collaborative effort from the prosecutor, from the defense attorney, and service providers to make that work. Um, I, I think the sense was that once the, the judge who started that court and was very invested in it left and went to another county, um, parts of that program continued for maybe a year or two years after, but um, it was really the personality of, of that judge that drove that court. Um, when he went across the state, uh, to the Wyndham area, they started a court there. It was not as successful. Um, it, unfortunately, he was in the process of retiring when he was trying to start the court, so um, it, it didn't have the, uh, the the support and the background that he had by being in the other court for three years. It was successful, but my sense was that not everybody was buying into it, um, and it was unfortunate, but um, we tried to sustain it. Um, even after he left, uh, but after about a year or so, um, it just 
everybody wasn't working together. The only way any of these courts, whether it's drug treatment court, as Judge Morrissey said, um, the, the DUI court, it has to be everybody buying into the concept um, or, or it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And unfortunately, it didn't work um, in, in the second second state. Um, that's the best answer I can give. I, I would say that what came out of it, though, were some best practices. And so that's one of the goals of the court is to, you know, we have done best practices down, particularly in the air, in the two areas that had the IDVD courts. And so we're taking those lessons and hoping to bring those to all of our courts. Um, you know, for those RFA days, that can, those can be difficult days. So it's a work in progress to get it spread throughout the state. Thanks for the question. I guess I would just add that the problem with some of these courts, most of them get started as pilot projects with grant funding. And when you get to the end of the grant, if you can't sustain the program, they end. And I think that's partially what happened in those other courts. The grants ran out and the courts were not self-sustaining. Um, and that's the difficulty we have in many of those. Yes, yes. Um, my question is in uh, particular about family court for child protection cases. So, you know, we have many cases that are languishing for a long period of time in the court system. Uh, in 2018, more than 80 children were, their case was closed when they had been an open case for more than three years. So, you know, the, child, the Family Preservation Act of 1983 was set specifically to um, counter that. But Vermont, I feel like, is within the snowball that we can't get out of because there's so many cases in the system already that we can't close that just don't have time in the docket. Uh, attorneys don't have time. Family service workers don't have time. It's a, it's a snowball effect, if you will, and more and more cases. I know you talked about that you tried to open a courtroom in one county and it just didn't work. Um, well, it, 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 it worked. It's just that it took more than just additional funding for the court. It took more than additional space, additional courtroom space. I understand. Uh, that, that was really what my point was. I understand. So I'm curious what the plan is for that. You know, if it's county sharing, you know, some counties have a higher, higher caseload than others. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what are the possibilities that we have to help solve some of that issue? I feel like the caseload is just growing because we can't close any of the cases that are in the system. We're going back every you know, six months for a status hearing and nothing has, is progressing, but there is no room in the docket to schedule times for further hearings. So I'm just curious, what is really the plan of that? We know what the problem is. We know how it's multifaceted and there's many pieces that are dependent upon it. I'm just wondering, what is the, what is the plan? What is, what is happening to solve that problem? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that the, there's a backlog uh, that's growing in this county, and I think it's a it's a real concern. And I think there are a number of different uh, reasons for it. Um, you know, it's not a cookie cutter system that we work in. Uh, this is not. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're not making widgets. We're not. We're not mass producing uh, justice. What, what what we're doing is we're using human resources which involves human judgment, the best judgment that we can bring to the problems, uh, informed by education and, and, the, and the structure of the law, of course, uh, to resolve cases. But it's not just a judge who uh, applies those skills to a particular case. It involves a staff uh, who work on uh, intake of cases and the management of cases. It involves uh, lawyers who come into the courtroom uh, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. One of the things, I had practiced law in Rutland County for almost 30 years when I was appointed to the Supreme Court. And uh, I thought I knew, I was a trial lawyer, I thought I knew everything there was to know about courts in this state. Because I practiced in every single county. And the first administrative meeting I was in, in Montpelier, uh, I was sitting next to a great judge who just passed away recently, Frank McCaffrey, who at that time was doing what Judge Grierson does. He, in that <coughs> he was the chief administrative trial judge for the state. I knew him very well. 
Um, he was from my hometown. I'd known him for a long time. And here, in this meeting, he started talking about the culture in a particular county as a basis for, as an explanation for what was going on in the county with respect to case flow. And I remember turning it, and he was sitting where Mary is right now, and I said, what are you talking about culture? You know, there's no distinction between uh, one county and another. And I've learned since then that culture is very much uh, a, 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 uh, a factor in how cases are managed. We are doing everything we can to make sure every county and the case flow in every county is handled exactly the same way. But this idea of culture and the human dimension that comes into managing case flow and deciding cases uh, to managing a courtroom uh, to uh, what the prosecutors, what the public defenders, what the uh, private uh, counsel, what the government counsel are doing, it's very, very important uh, in, in trying to define what answers to a problem uh, like this one uh, uh, would be. So I'm not giving you a short answer to this, and I'm not going to tell you that there's one black and white sort of fix. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated problem, and believe me, we're well aware of it, and we're working on it. Now, there are others here who've got more detail about this than I do, including <coughs> the bald guy in front of you, so maybe I'll give you some <laughs> information. Sorry, Sorry, Chief. I'll get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll find an opportunity. Don't worry, Judge Person tells me. So to answer your question, I, I need to go back a little bit to give you a little historical perspective of how we've arrived at this point. And if you go back only about three or four years, we really had what was what I have referred to in my role as a perfect storm. Um, we had a caseload of uh, children and abuse docket that doubled. Uh, so we had increased filings. Uh, we had the opiate problem that everybody's talked about, but the opiate problem has its own unique ebb and flow, uh, relapse and recovery, which complicates the case and extends those timelines you're talking about if we're going to give folks a fair chance to reunify. The third piece was over the time that I've been in this position, about four years, we've had a significant turnover in judges. At one point, we had six vacancies. When you take judges out of the, the equation, you're not going to get hearing time. And so it's taken this long, and as of right now, this is the first time that we've ever had uh, all of our judge vacancies filled. We have two vacancies right now that we're waiting for the governor uh, to complete the process. If we can get those judges, when you talk about a plan, we recognize that some areas, some counties, need help in certain dockets. Uh, Washington County right now is, has a significant number of Chin's cases of children abuse and neglect, and termination of parental rights cases. You talk about families waiting. We're waiting to get these cases heard. Rutland County has a very significant problem in their criminal docket. What we hope to be able to do is with these additional vacancies is to target them into different uh, areas so that they wouldn't be sitting in one court for a lengthy period of time. They might go to uh, Washington County and hear termination cases might spend some time in Rutland to try to attack that, target that, that criminal backlog. But as the chief indicated, having the judicial resources is only one piece of the puzzle. We literally have to look around the state, and for instance, I say to Rutland, if I have a judge, do you have the space to put them? And if you have the space, then we've got to be able to say, do you have the staff? Uh, and do you have the security open up a, a courtroom? And that's what it took up in, in, uh, in Franklin where the chief was referring to, but that literally took the legislature in one session to give us an additional judge, additional money to the Defender General's office, additional money to the state's attorney's office, and allowed us to convert what was a conference room or jury room to a small court. So we have to look around and find out if we physically uh, can actually open up another courtroom, but we hope with these additional resources that we can start targeting uh, some of these courts. That's the plan. I just hope no one retires on me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm mean, going to start all over again. You know, I, I, I'll say one more thing. Um, 
I want to be able to see it, so I'm going to stand up. And I can't, I can't see you around the handsome bald guy that's in the <laughs> He's trying. I should have said that. <laughs> you know, I was down in Bennett County a few years ago meeting with legislators, and they asked a very similar question which you just asked, because they were seeing, uh, they were hearing, the legislators were hearing from their constituents about the backlog of cases that we were seeing down there. And one of the things, one of the uh, truths of that situation, and I, I think it's similar here, was that we were pulling judges off of other dockets, uh, the divorce docket, for instance, to, to put them into places where we had a greater need for trying to keep up with the case flow. I think this is the kind of thing that happens county to county, depending upon the ebb and flow of what kind of cases. These Chins cases and the TPR cases are very complex, as you probably know. Uh, they're not simple cases. They're not, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're not single issue cases. It's not unusual to see experts come in to testify about the capacity of a parent to, uh, to parent a child. Uh, th these are very complex cases, and we don't have, this is one of the things I've been talking to the legislature about, dedicated resources, county to county or region to region, to address these cases. And what that means is, is that we wind up uh, in, with hearings that start, uh, evidentiary hearings that start, that don't finish within the time frame that has been allowed for good reasons, for good reasons. And then we try to schedule the continuation of the hearing and everybody, all the lawyers say, well, I can't, I've got, I'm double booked. I'm over here, I'm over here. And all of a sudden you've got kids that are parked, and this is one of the things that just is terrible to think about for me. You've got kids parked in foster care while you're trying to get these cases done. And my solution that I've suggested, as I say, to the legislature's dedicated resources, that's gonna cost money. You know, if you have regional teams of judges, uh, social workers, lawyers, prosecutors, and defenders, uh, and you ran it very similar to what we do with the environmental docket, if you're familiar with that. Uh, you know, it's an essential location, but the, the judge and the staff go out into the, to the places, to the courts, where the, the, the conflict exists, so the parties don't have to travel, and, and they hear the cases there. This is the kind of solution that I think the state needs to be looking at, We've got um, their attention because as of the last session, uh, they ponied up $7 million over three years and they want to see a wholesale revision, uh, not just to the court system and the justice system, but to the child welfare system. So they are actually talking in those terms and Judge Gerson's directly involved in that project. Anyway, I am sorry, I will say this, I am sorry that the system is not addressing uh, all the cases in a timely fashion uh, in your county. And um, I, I wish we had a good, easy solution for it, but um, you know, it's a very difficult problem that we're facing uh, right now. And, and I assure you we're doing everything we can to uh, try to address it. So, you know, having said that, I fell on my sword. I'll do it again if you want me to. Give me another. You got another question? I'll say that. Is that it? You know, it is six o'clock almost. This is a meeting like no other meeting we've had in any other county. I have to tell you that. You have you got a question? Well, I was just going to make a no. I was just going to make a comment, and that is, uh, for those of you here who are not part of the court system, we have many uh, staff people from the court system here, and um, they work really hard. Yeah. Um, and they're the ones who are, are on the front line, yeah. usually at the counter, dealing with people who are waiting for their hearings, want to have a hearing want to have something happen, can't afford a lawyer, want some help. They, they are um, the ones who are face to face with the public um, when members of the public are having frustrations 
um, with our shortness of resources. So yeah. I just want to recognize the good work. Yeah, well, here, here. Let me second that. Our, the staff that work in courts around the state are just unbelievable, unbelievably dedicated. And I found that they really care. I've seen a lot of court staff go out of their way to try to answer questions <coughs> for the public especially, you know, legal ones at times, and they can't get into giving legal advice, but I think to the extent that I've seen them really go out of their way to try to help people and connect people with resources. I'm, I'm really impressed. I think that's something that's extraordinary. Okay, I think that's it then. Thanks very much. Thank you.